So this plastic model is cast from a real human brain. So it may not look very impressive, but the brain is actually an incredibly sophisticated computational device. All the time, your brain is solving extremely difficult computational problems without you even being aware of it. Now, to illustrate that, I'm going to pick on somebody in the audience. How about you, Sher, in the white shirt? What's, what's your name? Sam. So, Sam? OK, Sam, catch. Well done. Now, let's just discuss what happened in Sam's drain, brain right then. So firstly, he took a continuous stream of sounds entering his auditory brain and split it into a series of individual words. Now, that's a very difficult problem. Um, he, the auditory part of his brain then had to send that to the language part of his brain to make sense of what I was saying. So as we'll see later, language is very complicated to understand because it's very ambiguous. Everything one says has lots of different possible interpretations. The visual part of his brain then had to track that object looming towards him, coming straight towards him, not a nice trajectory like this, but this object coming straight towards him, and was, had to predict exactly where that object was going to be. The motor part of his brain then had to send signals to his arm muscles to move his hands to exactly the right place to catch the brain. Now, that's what's mathematically called an ill-posed problem. There are infinitely many ways you can move your arms from one place to another. Yet Matt's brain instantly chose one that was perfectly appropriate and was able to catch the brain. Now, while that brain was in flight, in the few hundred milliseconds while that brain was in flight, Sam's brain made a number of inferences about the properties of this object. Now, if Sam had thought it was a very heavy object, he would have positioned his hands slightly differently to capture, catch a very heavy object. If I just pulled it out of a vat of olive oil, he would have positioned his hands again slightly differently to catch a very slippery object. So all that computation happened um, almost instantaneously in Sam's brain. And did it feel like much work? No, right, because those are the kind of problems your brain has evolved to solve. And they're actually much more difficult computational problems than the kind of things that feel like they take um, mental effort, like studying for exams, for instance. So Sam, if you could toss the brain back. Thank you. And let's have a big round of applause for Sam's brain. So obviously, we need um, insights from um, biology in order to understand how the um, uh, nervous system works. But also, we need insights from mathematics. Now, I want to show you now um, uh, an example of that to do with the neural code. So how is information represented in the brain? Well, it's represented through patterns of electrical activity, short pulses of activity called action potentials or spikes. Now, billions of those are flying around in your brain right now. And I want to show you um, some of those directly. So for that, I need a volunteer from the audience. How about you, madam? Please come up here. OK, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a simple device to record electrical activities from your arm. So if you could just roll up your sleeve for me. I'm going to hook you up and um, record some electrical impulses traveling down your arm to control your hand. Sorry, let's put that there and there. Now, you have insurance, right? Very good. Now, what's your name? Janet. OK, I'm just going to put this on the back of your hand. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to wire you up. And what's going to happen is I'm going to ask you to squeeze your hand. And we're going to see some of those electrical pulses traveling from the motor part of your brain um, down your arm to your hand. Now, let me just turn this on. Right. So what I'd like you to do is squeeze your hand for me. OK, so what we need to do is um, plug this in. OK. Uh, just to just, hold on, so why is this not working? I have no electrical in <laughs> my brain. That's the problem. OK, I've got these in the right place. So, um, ah, right, because I haven't plugged this yet, this orange cable in. I knew there would be something I forget. Now squeeze. That's better. OK, so. Squeeze again. So what you can hear is the sound of individual nerve impulses traveling down Janet's arm to control her hand. Squeeze again. Thank you. Now, what do you think would happen if, um, instead of you squeezing, I squeezed your hand? I don't think you'd get the same sound. Right, so let's try it. So just relax your hand. So nothing, right? Now, you squeeze. There we go. That's because when I do it, She's not sending the commands to her hand, so there aren't the same electrical impulses traveling down her arm. Now, we'll do one more thing before I let you go, which is we will rewire this and plug it into um, an app on my phone. This is a simple um, device from a company called Backyard Brains in, um, in the US. And what we're going to do is fire up this app. 
And let's just turn it around like this. OK, now, hopefully this is up on the screen. Now, squeeze. So we can see directly now those patterns of nerve impulses. So we can, we can zoom in, squeeze, squeeze really hard. And what we can do is we can threshold, squeeze it. There we go. So what we're seeing here is we're averaging together all the um, patterns that go over a certain um, level. And um, so that, that spike in the middle is the shape of one of those individual nerve impulses. So thank you very much, Janet, for illustrating that. I'll un un unhook you, and please, a round of applause for Janet. <laughs> okay. So obviously, we need biology to understand than that, but we also need mathematics. So um, a spectacular example of this is the Nobel Prize winning work of Alan Hodgkin and Andrew Huxley. So besides making recordings of some of the first impulses from um, um, neurons, they also developed a set of mathematical equations to describe the precise shape of those nerve impulses like we just saw. Now, using that model, we're able to make predictions about the effects of um, drugs, for instance, on the shape of those um, um, action potentials and therefore on how the brain computes. So this mathematical model is now a cornerstone of our understanding of how the brain works. And you might be interested to know that they actually shared the Nobel Prize with a great Australian neuroscientist called John Eccles, who was doing related work at the Australian National University at the time. So, so this is about modeling the shape of an individual um, action potential record from, from one neuron. Now, since then, technology has moved on. And just in the last few years, it's become possible to record the activity from many neurons simultaneously at single neuron resolution. Now, an example of this is the work we're doing in my lab here at the Queensland Brain Institute and School of Mathematics and Physics here at UQ. So for this, we use the zebrafish. Now, what's nice about the zebrafish is very young zebrafish are basically transparent. So you can look directly into their brain and see neural activity in their brain. We can label neurons in their brain fluorescently so that they glow when they're active. So we're going to zero in on this small part of the zebrafish brain. You see, this is tiny. This is less than half a millimetre by half a millimetre. And here's a movie of um, patterns of activity. So each of those green blobs is an individual neuron. And the change in um, its fluorescence is a measure of neural activity. So what we're doing here, this is the visual part of the uh, zebrafish's brain. And what we're doing is we're just showing patterns of visual stimulation. And you can see the patterns of activity that are produced in the zebrafish brain. So the question we're trying to address is how these complex patterns of activity actually represent information about the world. Now, you can see immediately that it's a much more complex situation than the, um, the, the nerve impulses traveling down the arm. Because in the central part of the brain, information is represented by distributed patterns of activity over many neurons simultaneously. So to understand that, we need uh, mathematics again, but now different kinds of mathematics. So, for instance, insights from statistics and also from a branch of mathematics, mathematics called information theory. So information theory was developed by an electrical engineer called Claude Shannon in the 1940s. And it allows us to talk very precisely about how information is communicated in the brain, much more precisely than the kind of non-mathematical descriptions that are more common um, in biology. So we've learned a little bit about how um, how the brain computes and how mathematics is a critical part of our understanding of that. Now what I want to do is talk about how those insights into understanding how the brain computes can be used to build better artificial intelligence systems, better AI systems. So brains work very differently from digital computers, but by understanding through neuroscience experiments, by understanding more about the algorithms that brains use to process information, we can try and implement them in AI systems and give those systems some amazing capabilities. So a couple, I want to highlight a couple of recent discoveries. So one is called deep learning. So on the left here, um, you have um, a schematic of the stages of visual processing in your brain. So this occurs through a series of um, a hierarchical series of layers. So information enters the eye and, and travels through several layers of neurons. And each layer is extracting more complex features of the input than the layer below. So that principle is implemented in an artificial neural network on the right. So here we have a series of layers again. Here there's, there's four layers, but um, some of these networks have many more layers than that, which is why they're called deep networks. And these networks have 
connections between the layers which can change their strengths. And it's this, these changing strengths of connections which encode information about the world. Now, what's amazing about these networks is that, we can, that they can learn general concepts just through seeing a series of specific examples. So, for instance, we can take a network like this. We can show it lots of pictures of dogs and tell it that's a picture of, uh, those are pictures of dogs. We can show it lots of pictures of cats and tell it those are pictures of cats. And then we can present a picture it's never seen before. And it is able to distinguish um, whether that's a cat or a dog based on its experience um, um, of, of seeing lots of pictures of cats and dogs. So these kinds of networks are now being investigated by a lot of leading technology companies as a way of extracting um, patterns information from large and complex data sets, for instance, regarding consumer behavior. Another recent advance has been uh, the theory of reinforcement learning. What that means is learning how to maximize um, uh, rewards through a series of actions. So this has been studied for decades in the context of the animal learning literature. For instance, how an animal might navigate through a maze to find um, where the most food is, how it learns the right decisions to make. And so by studying this literature, mathematicians have come up with um, learning algorithms which they can use to teach computers how to take a series of actions to maximize their rewards. And one of the, one of the um, outstanding examples of this is something called Q-learning. So what I want to do now is show you some examples from a company called uh, Google DeepMind in London, which is actually run by a guy who's got a PhD in computational neuroscience. And this, what they've done is combined deep, just in the last couple of years, they combined deep learning with reinforcement learning to create a general AI learning system. And as an example of what it could do, they applied it to classic Atari video games. So there's nothing particularly special about learning to play video games. It's just a nice example of a domain where you can illustrate the power of these networks. So they take, they take a network, this deep learning network combined with reinforcement learning. They show it lots of um, um, screen inputs and the game score. And then the network has to learn what actions to take to maximize its reward, I, I increase its game score in those situations. So move left, move right, stay still, or fire. So after training this network for long periods of time, Here's a movie of the trained network in action. So as you can see, it's learned quite well how to play this game. And um, if we skip ahead, you can see it's really become quite good. And in fact, for this game, um, the trained network has performance which is far superior to what um, is, uh, any human has achieved. However, playing these kinds of games doesn't involve long-range planning, right? It's just about responding to immediate threats. So a question you could ask is, can these same kind of mathematical learning principles also apply to cases where you have to look many, many steps ahead? So to investigate that question, just a few months ago, DeepMind looked at um, training a network to play the ancient game of Go. So this is a, um, a board game played on a 19 by 19 board where two players fight for control of territory on that board. Now, in some ways, it's a much more complicated game than chess, and the reason is because there are many more possibilities to explore than on the 8x8 chessboard. Now, computers have been beating humans at chess for a number of years, but until now, computers have been very mediocre uh, chess players. So what Google DeepMind did was they took a... Um, so, so they took these deep learning and reinforcement learning principles. They took a network. First, they trained it on expert human moves, so what a human would do in each situation. And then they took that trained network and they let it play against itself for a long time. So it gained more experience of the game, in fact, far more experience than any human could possibly amass in their lifetime. And then they challenged the World Go champion, Lee Sedol, to a match. It was a five-game match, and the computer won four games to one. So I want to show you a, um, an excerpt from game two of that match, which was um, um, move 37. So here is um, a brief excerpt. Yeah, from the Google uh, team was talking about uh, is this kind of, of evaluation uh, a value? Uh, ooh. That's a very that's ooh. a very surprising move. <laughs> I thought I thought it was I thought it was a mistake. Right. So the computer went on to win that game. So it appears that through these kinds of AI learning systems, we can now, at least in certain domains 
um, um, train computers to achieve performance which is beyond, uh, to make decisions which are beyond the capacity of humans to actually understand those decisions. And yet they're clearly good decisions because the uh, computer went on to win the game. Now, you might find that a bit worrying. I find it worrying, a lot of other people do too. But there are other domains where computers still have a long way to go. So I'm going to finish off by showing you um, some examples of that. So I mentioned before that language is very difficult to understand. So every sentence I've spoken so far has been very, very ambiguous. So each one, if you analyze it in detail, everyone has, every sentence has many possible meanings. But hopefully, it's been clear to you all what I've been saying. So to develop a computer system that can understand language is very challenging. And a nice way of showing that is through looking at a computer translation system. So if a computer translation system is working well, you should be able to take a simple sentence, convert it into another language, then translate it back again, and you should get back exactly what you started with, right? So here's some screen captures just from a few days ago from Google Translate. Okay, so the sentence is, will machine translation ever work, right? Let's ask Google Translate. We translate it into Chinese. We translate that Chinese back again, and the answer is, oh. I was tempted to say, oh, no, it didn't. So let's try converting it into a different language. Maybe we'll have more luck with a different language. Let's convert it into the Basque language. So here it is converted into Basque. Let's convert it back again. Oh dear, rather pessimistic assessment there. Let's try one more. Let's try converting it into Catalan and translate that back. Ah, more optimistic assessment. So we have a number of different opinions here, and cl clearly Google has some work to do um, on its translation systems. In fact, Google right now is um, developing deep learning approaches to this translation problem. So hopefully there will be better systems coming along very shortly. So to conclude, we need mathematics to help us understand how the brain learns from experience and how information is represented in the brain in terms of patterns of neural activity. Similarly, um, we can then use those insights into how the brain works to develop better AI systems. Also, advances in AI can help us help inspire new ideas about the algorithms the brain might be using to solve the very difficult computational problems it's solving all the time. So right now is a very exciting time, both for neuroscience and artificial intelligence, combined by the common language of mathematics. In the near future, I think we'll see big changes, both in the role that artificial intelligence plays in our lives, but also in our understanding of the fundamental principles by which our brains work. Thank you.